Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, this session is about the basics of pulmonary hypertension. We're going to talk about what the definition is, um, some of the treatment pathways that we target with our medications, the testing that's involved in making the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, and then some of the things that um, we see in the hospital and how we manage typically the patients that have to be admitted to the hospital. So welcome. Um, I'm Martha Kingman. I'm a nurse practitioner, and I work here at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Um, I am a family nurse practitioner, and I've been in the pulmonary hypertension clinic here in Dallas for 16 years, so lots, I've seen a lot of changes in the field. Um, I, my role is going to be just introducing the speakers and moderating the session and helping with the questions and the answers. We're going to each speak for about seven minutes. We have a pretty defined timeline. And then after that, we'll open it up to any questions that you may have um, it, with the topic of the basics of pulmonary hypertension. We, we are not able to answer personal medical questions, though we'll have to refer those back to your doctor. But any general questions that you have, we, we should be able to address for you. So I just want to introduce our panel. First is um, Marlena Fox. Um, Marlena is a graduate of the Medical University of South Carolina, where she attended from 2002 to 2006, and completed her prostacycline critical care residency at Shands at the University of Florida. Um, after completing residency, she joined the team at Orlando Regional Medical Center as a clinical pharmacy specialist in the medical intensive care unit and has served in this position for eight years. She's worked closely with the pulmonary hypertension program for the past five years, primarily focusing on patients in the hospital setting. Um, next, we have Dr. Mike Magoon in the middle here. And he is retired from cardiology after um, four years of training and 31 years on staff at Mayo Clinic. He's been involved in the management of pulmonary hypertension patients since his fellowship and started at Mayo PH Clinic in 1996 um, with PHA since 1992. And he was invited by one of the founders, who was his patient, as an original member of the Scientific Advisory Board, which we now call the Scientific Leadership Council. He served as chair of the Scientific Leadership Council and chair of the Board of Trustees for PHA. And now he's involved in the PHCC as chair of the Oversight Committee um, with his wife, Bonnie, also a passionate supporter of PHA, has attended every international conference since 1996. Uh, in the end, we have my uh, cohort in crime, Scarlett Hardin. She's an acute care nurse practitioner, and she uh, works with us at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Her role is primarily inpatient care. I do outpatient, she does inpatient. We're both very happy with that arrangement. So um, we just wanted to start off with a basic explanation of, you know, answer this question, what is pulmonary hypertension? And that's a, a topic or a question that can be a little bit complicated and, and often people get confused about it, to be honest. So the way I like to describe it is start off with the term pulmonary hypertension. It's an, a, kind of an umbrella term, and it just means the pressures in the lungs are high. And then under this umbrella, there's five different types of pulmonary hypertension. We call them WHO groups for World Health Organization. So we have WHO group one, WHO group two, WHO group three, WHO group four, and WHO group five. So if we start with WHO group one, those are patients that we call pulmonary arterial hypertension patients. All of our clinical trials, all of our 14 medications that we have to treat pulmonary hypertension are approved for this WHO group one. So if you're on medications, most likely you're a WHO group one patient. Now, before we go on to these other WHO groups, I want to tell you that there's subcategories of WHO group one PAH. And within that category, the most common, or about half of the WHO group one PAH patients are what we call idiopathic. And what idiopathic means is that we've done a big workup, put the patient through lots of testing, we're not able to determine the cause, and so we call those patients idiopathic PAH. 
Then the other half of the um, group one or who group one patients are what we call associated PAH. So that means that you have pulmonary arterial hypertension because of some association that we've been able to identify. The most common associated group is what we call connective tissue disease. Those make up a lot of our practices. And if you treat pulmonary hypertension, you have a lot of connective tissue disease patients. Connective tissue disease patients are mostly patients who have scleroderma, lupus, or mixed connective tissue disease. They all um, fall in that connective tissue disease category. Also in the associated groups, we have patients who have liver disease that develop a condition we call portopulmonary hypertension. There's congenital heart disease patients that fall into who group one. There's um, patients who took certain medications, um, one of them being the drug Fenfen that was on the market for diet loss. I'm sure all of you have heard about that. Methamphetamine now we know is a, an association. Um, and then there's a, a very small percent of patients who have what we call heritable, where they have a gene mutation and they have inherited the disease. And oftentimes there's multiple family members that have that. So that's kind of a synopsis of what WHO group 1 PAH is. It's a very rare disease. As you guys know, there's not too many, we think 30,000 or so people in the United States with group 1 PAH. If you look at group 2, they have pulmonary hypertension. If you do a right heart cath and just look at the pulmonary pressures, they'll be high. Group 2, though, is a very, very common type of pulmonary hypertension, and it's high pulmonary pressures because of high pressures on the left side of the heart. So those are patients who have heart failure, congestive heart failure, you've probably heard of that, or they have a problem with their valves. So those patients are treated a little differently. We see a lot of those folks in all of our practices, that's group two. Then we have pulmonary hypertension group three, or who group three. And these, this is where it gets a little cloudy. These are patients who have a lung condition that causes them to be hypoxic, which hypoxic means low oxygen levels. So it might be somebody who has bad COPD, emphysema, or pulmonary fibrosis, and they're hypoxic, and that hypoxia causes the pulmonary pressures to go up. And if, so we call those patients who group three pulmonary hypertension, okay? Now group four pulmonary hypertension, uh, there's been a lot of interest in lately. It's called CTEF, which is, is going to be a long word. It's chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And basically what that means is it's people who have had blood clots in their lungs, a pulmonary embolus, we call it. And most of the time, 95% of the time, those blood clots will go away over the first few weeks or month or two. But in a very small percent of patients, the clots don't go away. So their pulmonary arteries become blocked by blood clots, and those become chronic or they stay there over a long time. And so for, for those patients, the group four, CTEF we call it, the treatment for them is surgery um, for the most part, unless they um, are not surgical candidates, then that there's a medication approved for them. And then we have group five pulmonary hypertension, which is just a bunch of miscellaneous stuff that it's not worth spending time on, on that. So that's just sort of a basic overview of pulmonary hypertension. And so we're going to move now to Dr. Magoon, who's going to talk about the testing that patients with pulmonary hypertension undergo. Good. Thanks, Martha. That that, that actually, I, I don't know if you know it, but that was one of the best summaries of how to think about pulmonary hypertension that I've ever heard. It's, it summarized the World Symposium last, last time very well, so thanks for that introduction. Um, so she's described the different types of pulmonary hypertension. When you bring that into the real world of patients, you have to be able to, um, uh, 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 the medical duty is to evaluate the patient with with pulmonary hypertension. I think of this as occurring in three phases uh, of evaluation, a, a term I prefer over test, since not everything really falls into the category of a test. But the three, I call it the three S's. You have to be suspicious. You have to be certain. I know that's a C, but it sounds like an S. 
And then you have to be specific. So, so all of the evaluation is oriented to going through those three phases. Somebody who presents with shortness of breath, for example, doesn't automatically have pulmonary hypertension. There may be a number of other explanations. Pulmonary hypertension is relatively rare compared to those other explanations, so you have to, the, the physician has to think very specifically of pulmonary hypertension to test for it. Now, there are a lot of general tests that can be done that raise the suspicion. There are things on the electrocardiogram, and we won't go into detail because that would be medical school, but there are things on the electrocardiogram, the chest x-ray, blood tests, all of which are done at a lot of annual examinations that can at least raise the possibility in the astute physician's mind that something is going on that merits further evaluation. Of course, listening to the patient's history is a test in itself because there's a lot of information in that. The physical examination, putting the stethoscope on the chest and listening to the, to the heart, there are subtle signals there. But ultimately, the test that raises the suspicion is, is the echocardiogram. The echocardiogram, by means of being able to measure blood flow and pressure differences within the heart, can lead to a high level of suspicion of pulmonary hypertension or lead to a high level of excluding that as a possibility. So a patient with shortness of breath and no specific explanation on the simple tests really has to undergo an echocardiogram, not just to diagnose pulmonary hypertension, of course, but to diagnose a whole host of other possible reasons for shortness of breath. If the suspicion is raised, then we have to go on to the next S, be certain. There is no such thing as having a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension without the certainty provided by a heart catheterization. Now, there are all sorts of different heart catheterizations. Most people, when they think of that, think of having a coronary angiogram, which is squirting dye into the coronary arteries to see if there's a reason that they're having chest pain or a heart, heart attack. That's not the type of heart catheterization we talk about for gaining certainty about pulmonary hypertension. That's one in which the catheter is not injecting dye, but simply measuring pressures and blood flow within the heart circulation and the lung circulation. So a, a high pressure, when it's measured by heart catheterization done correctly, is a certainty that the patient has pulmonary hypertension. End of story. But there's another S. We now need to be specific, and that's where Martha's background is important. There are all different types of pulmonary hypertension, all different types of associated disease that may be present with pulmonary hypertension, of which the pulmonary hypertension is the first signal. So further testing is required, especially at that stage, which will be directed again to specific blood tests to look for underlying disease like connective tissue disease, autoimmune disease, HIV, liver abnormalities, uh, there may be other imaging tests done to look at, to look at uh, um, especially the lung circulation in terms of whether there are evidence of blockages that might be caused by blood clots, because that is one diagnosis of all that you don't want to miss. It's a, the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is a potentially essentially curable disease if it's, if it's treated with the appropriate kind of surgery. So you don't want somebody to be walking around with chronic thromboembolic disease that's not known. Uh, pulmonary function tests to see if there's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or other, other form of type 3 um, pulmonary hypertension. We want to look for uh, evidence of valvular heart disease that might be causing type 2 pulmonary hypertension. All of this can be done by echocardiogram or appropriate imaging. So, so uh, this is just to keep it simple, and I know that everything we say in our little seven minutes is going to raise more questions than answers, so we'll leave time for that. Right. Thank you. Uh, Marlena is now going to talk about some of the, the treatments, uh, specifically the types of treatments that we use. Good morning. So I'm the pharmacist on the panel, so it makes sense that I would be speaking about the medications this morning. Um, all of us are thankful that you know, as you guys know, we've had an expansion in the past few years with the number of medications that are available. 
which gives us great options for individualizing care for you guys and picking agents that are appropriate for your specific disease state, your severity of disease, and also risk factors and adverse effects that you might have on a particular drug. There are four classes of medications that can be used for the management of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So that's WHO group one. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about each class. The first class is the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. This group of medications works on the nitric oxide pathway. So what that means to you guys is when you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, a lot of um, processes are happening in the pulmonary arterial endothelial cells. Primarily what, um, what you're looking at is a decreased production of nitric oxide and a decreased production of prostacyclin. Both of those things are vasodilators. So when you have a decreased production of that, you can actually have vasoconstriction or tightening of your pulmonary arteries that's worsening the disease. So by working on the nitric oxide pathway, we have increased vasodilation, which is helping um, the, the disease process. So the first class phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors has two medications that are approved for pulmonary arterial hypertension. The first is sildenafil, brand name is Robotio. The second is Tadalafil with the brand name of Adcerca. So these medications, um, just like many of the other medications that can be used for treatment, can cause hypotension or decreased blood pressure. You can also see headaches, flushing, muscle pain. Um, so those are some of the things that we monitor for in our patients. It's also really important that patients that are on these medications are not on um, nitrates. So if you're taking, taking nitroglycerin or any of the long-acting nitrates like MDOR or things like that for cardiac disease, then you want to make sure your doctor knows that because typically you would avoid those medications in combination. The second class of medications that I'll discuss, discuss is a newer class. It's called soluble guanylate cyclase stimulators. There's only one medication in that class. Um, that medication is Rioseguat or Adempis. Um, this medication also works on the nitric oxide pathway, so a kind of similar mechanism of what we just talked about, but it's a little bit uh, different class. This medication has the same side effects um, that you would see with the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors that we just talked about. Um, in addition to um, contraindications in using it with nitrates. You also want to make sure your physician knows if you are a cigarette smoker because there are significant interactions with that. Um, and also if you stop smoking, your physician or prescriber would need to know that as well to adjust the dose. That particular medication is part of a REMS program. REMS programs are set in place just um, so that we have um, so that we can identify patients that are appropriate to take the medications. REMS programs require that patients be enrolled and approved prior to starting the medication. And the rationale for the REMS program for Rioseguat or Adempis is due to teratogenicity, which means it can cause harm to a baby or a fetus. So this particular program is for um, women of childbearing age. They would have to be enrolled before starting that medication. The third class of medications are the endothelin receptor antagonists. So going back to our um, disease state and how these medications affect um, the targets and the pathways, endothelin-1 is a, is a potent vasoconstrictor. So that's causing tightening of the pulmonary arteries. So by an antagonist means that you're blocking those receptors. So by blocking those receptors, we block some of that vasoconstriction that occurs to help vasodilate those pulmonary arteries. The endothelin receptor antagonist, there's three medications approved in that class. The first one was um, Bosentan, brand name is Treclear. That medication is dosed twice a day. Um, it, is, it is also part of a REMS program. For this particular medication, the REMS program was put in place because of teratogenicity or fetal harm and also liver failure. So that's very important for patients who are on that drug to have baseline and monthly liver function tests as well as pregnancy tests. The other two medications in that class are newer agents. Both, um, Ambrosentan, brand name is Lateris, and the newest one is Massey Tentan with the brand name of Opsumit. 
Both of those medications are once daily medications. They do have a little bit better side effect profile in that they're not notoriously known for having that liver failure that you can see with bocentan. They also have a little less drug interactions, um, which might be helpful depending on what medications, other medications you guys are on. Um, and so that, all of those medications in that class are all part of the RIMS program as well. And the last class um, is probably the most robust class is the prostacyclines. So just like nitric oxide, prostacycline is a vasodilator. So in, in pulmonary arterial hypertension, you can have a decreased production of prostacycline. So by giving these medications, you're helping to promote vasodilation of the pulmonary arteries. So um, for prostacyclines, the first prostacycline available on the market was in the early 1990s. It was epoprostenol, or brand name Flolan. That medication is available as an IV continuous infusion, and that's really important. Um, it's a great drug for some patients because it is short acting, and so patients who have severe pulmonary arterial hypertension or patients who have an acute compromise might benefit from Flolan. But the downside of Flolan is because of its short duration of action, it's important that patients are very careful with their pumps and know how to manipulate their pumps. They also have to be very conscientious with their access lines um, and know how to handle those in a very quick manner to pre prevent a medical emergency if there was a disruption in therapy. Um, also, with any of the IV continuous infusion therapies, you really have to be careful because you have an increased risk of infection due to that insertion of the central venous line. Um, another medication in this class, Traprostanil, the brand name is Remodulin, is also available as an IV continuous infusion, but it's a little longer acting, which might enhance the safety of that drug over Flolan. It's also available as a subcutaneous infusion, which is beneficial because you don't have as much risk of infection um, for subcutaneous administration. The downfall of subcutaneous administration might be site pain. So that's something that a lot of patients have a lot of difficulty with. But there are many things that we can do to help with site pain. So making sure that we discuss that with the healthcare providers is really important. Next, we have inhaled therapies. There's two in, in therapies available for inhalation, Tyvaso and Ventavis. And those might be good for some patients who um, don't, want, don't want or can't handle dealing with the um, continuous infusion medications. But the inhalation therapies are given either four times a day for Tyvaso or six to nine times per day for Ventavis. So that can be difficult to comply with as well. Um, the biggest side effect with the inhalers or in therapies for inhalation is cough which is a problem in approximately 50% of patients. But there's also many things that we can work with you to help minimize your cough as well. Um, and last but not least, we have oral prostacyclines, which is um, a great benefit for many patients. It's changed the life for lots of patients. I will say it's probably not going to be the drug of, you know, it's not going to be the miracle drug for everybody. It doesn't work for everybody. Some patients can't tolerate it. And some patients have a severe enough disease that maybe the oral therapy doesn't work for them. But for the patients that can take it, um, certainly improved quality of life, improved compliance. Um, there's two drugs on the market, Arenatram, which is oral triprostanil, and then um, oral selexipag, which is Uptravi. So both of those medications are even either given twice a day or three times a day. All right, thank you guys. Next is Scarlett Hardin, who's going to talk about hospital implications. Uh, we wanted to also talk about the importance of a low-sodium diet. You know, today we've talked about what pulmonary hypertension is, about the medications that we can take, but a low-sodium diet is something that you as the patient have complete control over, whereas we as the provider do not. So it's extremely important that you take time to learn what is the sodium content of the foods that you are consuming. So as you came in this morning, uh, there was a handout. The handout uh, includes a, a label that is extremely important that you start to learn to associate yourself with to look at the amount of sodium that is in the food that we eat on a daily basis. 
and also you'll see a grouping of just uh, some ideals of foods that you want to incorporate into your diet and those that you want to avoid. So why is it so important and why do we give so much emphasis to a low sodium diet? Well, what happens is that when you and I eat high sodium diets, we have a tendency to retain fluid with that. So if you didn't have pulmonary hypertension, more than likely what would happen is you'd wake up the next morning and you'd feel a little bit bloated. But when you have pulmonary hypertension, it increases the volume that the heart now has to work with. So if you didn't have pulmonary hypertension, that extra volume probably wouldn't be too much of a workload. But because you have pulmonary hypertension and the heart is already having to overwork to overcome the high pressures in the lung, the extra volume adds an extra workload. So we want to reduce that workload. So for many of you guys, we'll put you on diuretics like Lasix and Torsamide and Bumax. But what happens is that if you have a high sodium diet, despite the fact that we're giving you these other diuretics, it becomes ineffective or less effective. So it's really important. So the very first step that I ask my patients to do is to try to limit the amount of sodium in their diet to around 2,000 milligrams a day. So one of the easier ways to accomplish that is to take a look at the food label. For most of us, we eat less than 2,000 calories a day. So if I'm looking at my calories on my label and my calories are more than my sodium, I'm doing a pretty good job at staying under 2,000. If my calories are significantly lower than my sodium, that should be a food that I avoid. So if my calories are 400 per serving and my sodium is right at 425, that's an acceptable food for me to have. Unless it happens to be a pizza roll and I plan to eat 10 of them, then I'm already at 4,000 milligrams of sodium. So it's really important that you take a look at the serving size and the sodium and think of it to yourself, what is it that I'm actually going to be eating as a group? So there are some foods in general that we automatically say we need to try to avoid. Those foods are typically processed foods. And when I think of processed foods, I think of foods that are boxed, I think of things that are canned, or things that are prepared for me. Those foods that first come to mind are like raviolis, spaghettios, canned soup. Those types of foods really need to be avoided. I cannot think of a single soup off the top of my head that is low sodium which comes into uh, another important reason that I stress is that a lot of advertisement today will say healthy, it will say low sodium, when in fact it is not. It may be lower sodium than what the original was, but it's still it's too high sodium. A perfect example of that is a soup. So a typical soup we usually eat the full can of soup, which two and a half servings. It's about 500 to 600 milligrams per serving. So that one can of soup is 1,500 milligrams of sodium on a diet that we're trying to restrict to be 2,000 or less. A low sodium soup is about 350 per serving. We're still at 800 milligrams for that one little can of soup. So unless you're making homemade soup with no sodium added broth, um, I would encourage you to try to avoid soup. It's one of the higher sodium foods there are. Other things that come to mind immediately are things that come from the pig. I'm talking about ham, bacon, sausage, all of those things that we love. It's cured with sodium, it's high in sodium. Other things that are less suspicious are things that are tomato-based. So we're looking at pizza sauce, tomato sauce, marineras, uh, gravies, cream gravies. Those are also very high in sodium unless you are preparing them yourself and not adding in the sodium. Um, a good rule is that a food can really be considered to be low sodium if it's less than 130 milligrams per serving. High sodium is considered to be 400 milligrams. Um, I also uh, ha often have the question about, um, or the statement I should say, I never put salt on my food, so I should be okay. 
That would be great if the manufacturers went by the same rule. It's what the manufacturer has put in the actual canned goods or in the prepared goods that we have to watch out for. Um, uh, you know, a lot of us um, are, are busy. We have to grab quick meals. And so people are always asking me, what about fast food? So I've looked at a lot of fast food. And somebody said, well, what would you eat if you went to a fast food restaurant? I have three options when I go to a fast food restaurant. That's low sodium. That's a salad without any dressing, unless they happen to have vinegar and oil. That would be a soft-served ice cream or fresh fruit. Other than that, almost everything that is out there is over 800 milligrams per serving. Some of them are even approached 3,000. Um, sandwiches. Sandwiches seem kind of safe. They're not safe at all. The uh, processed meat that they have is extremely high in sodium, so we would ask for you to avoid those. One other thing that you'll notice on your list that I think is kind of unique is lemon pepper. It sounds so innocent, lemon and pepper. Surely there's no salt in that. 360 milligrams for each teaspoon. Each teaspoon of sodium is about 2,300 milligrams of salt or sodium in it. So those are important. I'm sure that you guys will have some other questions like, well, how do I do that? And we can discuss that as you come up with questions. The other thing I wanted to go over really quickly is about what issues and what do I typically see with people being hospitalized. Shortness of breath is probably the number one reason. And guess what the shortness of breath is caused from? volume overload, and sometimes it's related to dietary discretion, and sometimes it's not related to anything the patient has done, it's just worsening of the disease. But it's probably the number one reason, shortness of breath. Uh, other things that can cause shortness of breath would be uh, a blood clot in the lungs, uh, an infection, a viral infection like the flu, something to that nature. But shortness of breath is by far the number one admission that I have into the, into the hospital uh, besides some type of infection where it's a urinary tract infection or whether it's pneumonia. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. So the, the next 30 minutes is for you guys to ask whatever questions you would like to ask of the panelists and uh, we'll do our best to answer those. So, um, yes. <laughs> what category do things like uh, Lateris and Opsimit fall into as far as the medications? Okay, Marlena? Lateris and Opsimit are endothelin receptor antagonists. Um, the other one in that class is Bosentan, brand name is Treclear. So those are medications that, that work on that endothelin pathway to prevent the vasoconstriction from occurring. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, the uh, lady in the orange. Can you tell me on the testing, the cardiac MRIs, I know for pediatric patients they're using those more just, you know, for, so they don't have to do the casts every year. Can you just explain more what that will show and when that type of stuff? Uh, the, use of, <clears throat> the use of MR scans is increasing, uh, as is CT scans. Um, and it differs from patient to patient exactly what the test is looking for. In, in congenital heart disease, it's a good, good way to look at cardiac structure. Um, there are signals on the MR scan of what the, the pressure range might be but, and what the res uh, blood flow through the lungs looks like, but, um, but it's not as specifically accurate than for pure pressure measurement as, as is the catheterization itself, invasive though the catheterization may be. Um, so it sort of depends on why it's being done. Also look, uh, looking for uh, obstruction in the lung circulation, like uh, the blood clots, the CT scan is, is very good. And we still recommend the VQ scan, or the so-called uh, nuclear scan, looking for blood clots for the simple reason that although it's not always accurate, it, meaning it, it, there's the term sensitivity and specificity, it's highly sensitive it's not very specific, meaning that if you have a blockage, it will almost certainly find it, find that it's there. If you don't have a blockage, it may also say it's there. But you would rather you would rather 
have it be inaccurate that way than to have it be inaccurate by identifying everybody that doesn't have a blockage but misses some patients that do have a blockage. A little bit complicated, but, but and you want a sensitive test for something screening, some screening something that you don't want to miss at all. In, in our program at UT Southwestern, we do routine cardiac MRIs on our patients. And what we're, what we're primarily looking at is the size of the right ventricle, so the, the pumping chamber on the right side of the heart. We look, it, the MRI gives us a really precise measure of that size, and then that's something that we can follow. We do them every six months or every year. And then if the right ventricle starts to get bigger, then that's when we're going to get concerned. And it also gives us a, a really nice measurement of the function, how well that right ventricle is squeezing. So that's um, what we do, and we do those routinely. So. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, if a two-year-old child comes to the doctor, what would make you suspicious of pulmonary hypertension? Um, I'm not a pediatrician, but, but uh, you know, just a failure to, to um, thrive, a failure to, to make milestones in terms of physical growth would be, be one thing. Certainly, um, um, problems that are identifiable in the examining room by physical examination like cyanosis, which is blueness uh, due to low oxygen, which could be due to multiple reasons, but pulmonary hypertension can be a part of many of those reasons. Um, uh, findings on listening to the heart and so on would, would, would provide uh, clues. So uh, again, it may not be the first thing that pops into the doctor's mind, but if someone had, if some child had those findings, an echocardiogram should be fairly low on the list of things to get. I mean, fairly high on the list, a low threshold for getting it. Um, uh, and that should, you know, provide the major clue as to whether to go ahead with further, more intensive investigation. Uh, lady in the white shirt? I know that the VQ scan, is that the one that looks for blood clots? Yes. Um, I never had that. I had a CT scan. Now, is that, is that adequate? It, it, the, the question, if it wasn't heard, is, is a CT scan equivalently adequate to a ventilation perfusion scan? Um, the, the official recommendation is to do the ventilation perfusion scan for the reason I said, the high, it's got the highest sensitivity. The CT scan gives a huge amount of information about the lungs, and it, as well as the possible presence of blood clots. But there's all the, there are niggling instances in which the CT scan can miss evidence of a, of a chronic blood clot. Um, that said, the sensitivity is very high. The, the technology is always improving. The additional benefits of doing a CT scan, like looking at right ventricular size and function, lung circulation, morphology, the circulation itself, argues strongly on its behalf. And if it was confidently read by a good radiologist as being normal and not showing blood clots, I don't think I would and unless there were other reasons to suspect they were present, and, uh, I would not necessarily go back and do a ventilation perfusion scan. Uh, it looks like we have a question in the back. Yes. Hi. Yes. Yeah, sometimes um, you hear people ask if somebody is more symptomatic, and that might be a reason why you add another drug or start some sort of therapy. Um, but I, it feels like. I've also heard that if you're symptomatic, you're, you know, in, in a lot of cases, you might even be in heart failure. And so uh, you might be needing to start those drugs much more sooner before you're symptomatic. So I'm just curious to get your gauge on kind of, do you wait for symptoms? Do you treat early? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of other things, pressures and the condition of the heart that I'm, I'm sure you're basing that decision on. But just what goes into that calculation to add another drug? I could take that. 
Uh, so when we're evaluating patients over time, they've had the diagnosis and we've initiated a therapy, and, and I think the question is, then what sort of things do we look at to make the determination on whether or not we're going to add another therapy or change the therapy? And so the way I answer this question is I say there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. So when you said, you know, the patient's feeling more symptomatic or having more shortness of breath, more chest pain, maybe more serious things like fainting, that's one piece of the puzzle, more of a subjective how the patient feels part. Then we're going to look at and do some testing, typically. For us, it might be cardiac MRI, other um, centers, it might be a right heart cath to look at the pressures, maybe an echo to look at that right ventricular size and function, six-minute walk test to see if that's getting worse would be one piece of the puzzle. There's lab work called a BNP that we can do to see if the heart's under stress. And so we look at all of those pieces of the puzzle and it becomes pretty clear. If there's a predominance of things going the wrong way or important things going the wrong way, that's when we're going to escalate therapy or add therapy. So it's not, I would say, not one particular thing usually. Do you have anything to add to that? That's a hard question to pin down to a simple answer, but um, you raise a really important point, I think, that goes across the whole discipline, which is if somebody is stable, is that a good thing? Well, it depends what you're stable at. You know, if, if you're what we call functional class three and walking 325 meters in a six minute walk, that's, and you're doing, and you did that last year, that's good that you're stable. But it's not very satisfactory, is it? So it, it, it becomes a judgment based on the interaction between you and, and, the, and the medical caregivers as to whether that's in a satisfactory classification as far as your, whether you, whether you progress medications in a stable patient has to do with whether A, they're satisfied, and whether B, they are falling into a category of characteristics that puts them at high risk for deteriorating in the, in the future. So if you want to treat early under either of those circumstances. I would say too, there, there's data you know, illustrating that starting combination therapy up front might be beneficial as well. So, you know, if, if a prescriber does start multiple ther therapies at once, it may not indicate that, that your disease is progressing. It could just be that they are trying to be proactive and, and start those therapies earlier. Uh, yes. Being able to do um, heart casts while awake. Do you worry? Because I, I have a daughter who's 12, and we've always done, you know, she's been put out for it. But well, uh, at, at UT Southwestern, we deal with adults, and we do all of our heart casts awake. Uh, we do a right heart cath. The approach is on is in the neck. Uh, we numb up the neck. It takes us about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, after you're finished with the heart cath, we remove the actual catheter. We put a Band-Aid on you, we send you off to clinic. It's an outpatient. Uh, it is, for the most part, um, uh, a very simple procedure. So pediatrics are a little bit different. Um, I do know for pediatric patients that they often do, that they often do um, uh, sedate those individuals. Uh, I think from a, a fear factor or a factor of having them, you know, whether or not they can hold steel and probably for safety reasons. Intubated. We Have, do you know anything about pediatric heart caths? Huh? You know anything about pediatric heart caths? A little. <laughs> They're smaller. No. <laughs> smaller catheter probably. No, too. no, no. So for the kids. It does take longer for the following reason. Most kids are not done awake because it freaks them out if you just do that. Most kids actually, too, because depending on their age, providers worry about damaging the vessels in their neck, so they tend to do them through their leg. Okay, so if you have it done through your leg, that you need to lay flat for a couple hours after it. So that's why it takes much longer. But it's, it has to do with... Uh, and, and the other part is most of the time they're going to give them a whiff of ketamine or something like that to give them a little bit of anesthesia so that they don't feel it and that they don't remember it. So that's why it takes longer. And they don't, 
most pediatric people, I mean, the youngest kid I think I've done is about nine, but you don't want to, they don't want you messing with the vessels in their neck. So in a kid, yes, it's different than an adult. Other questions? Uh, yes. Hi, I have a question about the numbers when you do uh, the heart caths. Uh, I know that's like the best way to diagnose pH. So what are the normal pressures you see in a heart and what number do you go, hey, this number is high enough that you have pH? And also just curiosity, what's the highest that a heart can handle? What are the highest pressures you see? So the first part of the question is there are specific normals. Um, although you would be surprised is that the real, there's not a whole lot of data on what the true normals are because we don't normally go around and cast everybody who's normal, okay? So the limited data on normals though, so you're, you're, it's very interesting because a normal person's average pressure, their mean pulmonary artery pressure should be less than 20, okay? But you really don't have pulmonary hypertension unless your pressure is 25, okay? And that was... To be honest, 25 is sort of a made-up number. It's two standard deviations above the 20. So you would think that it would be abnormal. What the true number is, is, never, is that's what you get, is 25. So what's the highest you can, you can tolerate? It depends on a lot of things. Probably some of it's genetic. Some of it depends how slowly your pulmonary hypertension progresses so that your right ventricle can... Uh, adapt to the change. I mean, the highest pressure I've ever seen on a cath was a, a mean pulmonary pressure of almost 120. So a PA systolic of 165, 170. And that person actually was not in right heart failure because probably it had taken so long and it developed so slowly that her right ventricle was uh, able to compensate. Um, the other major pressure that you want to know is what's called the wedge pressure or the occlusion pressure, which is a pressure reflecting the left side of your heart. Um, normal is now considered less than 15. The number has slowly gone up over the years as the population has aged or as we've gotten heavier, shall we say. Um, used to be actually down around eight, nine, and now it's up to 15. So anything above 15 suggests that you have dysfunction on the left side of your heart Okay, anything less than that, certainly if it gets down into single digits, really does uh, pretty much reflect that this is true pulmonary arterial hypertension. Gentleman, oh, gentleman in the ball cap? Um, my, my question is, how do you classify a person that has multiple parts of pH? Like you were talking about like the, the hoops or like the, the groups of pH earlier. Yes. And like, how do you class? Like, I'm I'm an example of that where I have, I have liver failure, but I also have like um, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And so, how do you classify a person with that into multiple groups? Um, Scarlett, do you are you would you like to answer that? Well, uh, not knowing your medical history, I, I would first wonder. Have you been told that your liver wasn't the problem with your pulmonary hypertension? Um, I was first told um, that I had idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And then my doctor referred me to a liver specialist or like um, a person who does liver functionality tests. And they told me that I had um, the li liver portal hypertension or something in my liver that was going on and I had an enlarged liver. And so I was wondering, how do you classify um, somebody that has two different pHs in, like, or like two different parts of like the same disease into the different groups? Well, what I would first do is I have to d decide what is the determining factor of the pulmonary hypertension. So if I have somebody with an enlarged liver or somebody with quote unquote liver disease and it's not cirrhosis, then more than likely or possibly the liver disease is related to too much fluid in and around the heart and that's what the liver disease is caused from and ultimately that's caused from the pulmonary hypertension and I would guess that's why they are calling yours idiopathic. So your pulmonary hypertension led to the, the liver problems. 
And of course, that, that is an educated guess on your part, not knowing your, your medical record. But there are individuals that have what we refer to as multifactorial reasons to have pulmonary hypertension, meaning that they not only have uh, a diagnosis of lung disease, but they also have a diagnosis of, of pulmonary hypertension. We see that most frequently in our connective tissue disease patients, those that have like scleroderma. So scleroderma can attack and cause pulmonary hypertension and fibrosis of the lungs. Uh, and, but we do go ahead and treat them as group one pulmonary hypertension patients. Yes, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, I've been on multiple therapies for almost two years now. I uh, added the third one about eight months ago, which is Tybaso. And they finally turned around and said, okay, it's connective tissue disease. And I've been approached about doing a study for rituximab. Yes. But I live in Tampa, Florida, and the study's in Charleston. South Carolina, and it requires a lot of trips. Right. I was wondering if anybody in the panel knew of any other therapies that are coming out for specific scleroderma-related PAH. Uh, Dr. Magoon, would you like to take that question? Well, uh, you know, all of the therapies that are being looked at potentially would apply to pulmonary vascular disease with scleroderma. Whether the the effects of those would be the same in a patient with scleroderma as one with, with idiopathic PAH or with portopulmonary hypertension or something like that is unknown and which is why the, the studies are done. Um, but a specific medication, I don't, do you know yes. which? Okay. So, actually this is pretty much it. So I'm at Boston University, we have 1,100 scleroderma patients. So we do, we are one of the sites of the rituximab study. Okay, and we actually have it's farther two. Away than Charleston. Huh? That's farther away than Charleston. It is. It's not, so there, there are, there are one, two. There are three studies that are designated currently going on, or will be starting within the next couple months, that are for scleroderma patients only with pulmonary hypertension, who are on background therapy. One is the rituximab, which is actually almost done. I think there's. Uh, four or five more slots. It was 60-something patients. I think there's five more slots to go. There's a couple other one with the Riata drug, the Bardoxolone, is uh, specifically for um, scleroderma patients. And then there's a one looking at a, actually a drug that's used currently to treat um, multiple sclerosis, actually, which is Tecfidera, which is a, a biogen drug that's sort of an antioxidant that's actually going to be uh, the trial is up and starting probably in a couple months looking at only scleroderma patients with pulmonary hypertension. So there are these at least three that I know of, of which, unfortunately, you're in South Carolina. Move to Boston. We can take care of them. Or Dallas. We're in the study, too. So move to Boston. We can fix you up. No. Dallas. No, no, no. Okay, Dallas, then. Actually, okay. that doesn't matter because you're in air conditioning anyway, so it doesn't change it. No, but... Most of the studies that you're looking at, if you're looking for specifically scleroderma studies, are going to be in near or at centers that have enormous scleroderma populations. Okay, so you're talking us, you're talking Pittsburgh, you're talking things like that, because you need a large center in order to roll enough patients in these trials to actually see if they do anything. clinicaltrials.gov for the NIH, and they, you can find one. Closely. The closest one with the rituximab to you is probably Duke. Okay, we have just uh, about three minutes, and I see three hands, so we'll try to go through these quickly. If a person's diagnosed with non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver, would you, and there's a history of pH in the family, would you look to them to have them tested also for pH? Dr. Magoon? You, the very first step would be just like diagnosing anybody who, with a suspicion of pulmonary hypertension. You would want to do an echocardiogram, and you'd want to have the suspicion of why you would be doing the echocardiogram to be, begin with. Are they hypoxic? Are their oxygen levels low? Are they short of breath? Are they extremely tired and fatigued? And that can meet a 
number of different diagnoses, but you need to have the suspicion there first. So you have somebody who has cirrhosis, you have somebody who's short of breath, I think, yes, that buys them an echocardiogram to see if they do have elevated right-sided heart pressures. Okay. Um, yes, in the back, in the blue shirt. This lady in the white up there has asked if I raised her hand every time. Oh, is I'm there, sorry. Is there okay, someone that you would recommend or a center that you would recommend that had maybe more information on CTEF? Um, I, I guess I keep thinking because I got the pH and then more pointedly the PAH from the blood clots that just won't stop. If I could stop the blood clots, there's, uh, I, you know, maybe there's, that's my key, but how do I, how do I find someone? So there's an excellent website, ctef.com, that has an enormous amount of information for patients all about CTEF. So I would recommend starting there. And then any accredited uh, pulmonary hypertension center or major pulmonary hypertension center would be able to address that. And then if surgery is indicated, send, send you to the yeah, right I place. I for surgeries. Okay. But start at ctech.com. It's really a great website. Yes, I'm sorry I missed you earlier. Yeah, sure. So your wedge, your wedge pressure should be less than 15, 15 or less. That's considered, above that is considered that you have a contribution at least of your pH from left heart disease. Okay, so, and that's the group two that we So that would about. be group two. It's, it's usually, it can be indicative of, but it doesn't tell you what kind of left heart disease. It could be true ventricular disease, either systolic or diastolic, or you could have valvular disease, either your mitral valve or your aortic valve, but if your pressure on your left side of your heart's elevated, it suggests that you've got something going on that's cardiac contributing. Can you? Yeah. Um, is it using, I mean, is it? Well, when you're first diagnosed, okay, you're probably in a group, okay? Now, once you, once you have PAH, that, you know, that doesn't prevent you from something else, you getting something else or something happening uh, during the rest of your life. And I will tell you, in all honesty, now, a lot of people who had PAH, true PAH, when they were diagnosed... 10, 12, 15, 20 years ago have now gotten older and have developed diastolic heart disease. So they've, over time, because of aging and other risk factors, they've raised their left-sided heart pressures. They still do have PAH, but now they also have something in group two because of their life, basically. As Scarlett said, that's what we tend to call multifactorial now. Well, but they so, weren't when they were diagnosed. Right, they had become, right. as they got older, as things happened. Right, or thing, new things are determined. Okay, so that, uh, we, we have to wrap up. We are on a kind of a hard stop now. So I just want to thank all of you for coming, and I'd like to thank our panelists for doing a great job.